Hey everyone, welcome to session 81 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by the Central Reach Charting a New Course workshop series. This is a two-day workshop, good for 12 continuing ed units. It's going to be all about precision measurement and precision teaching. It'll be taught by Rick Cabina and Amy Evans, two people I've gotten to know pretty well over the last few years, and boy, do they know their stuff. This will be taking place in the Boston, Massachusetts area on April 18th and 19th. And again, that's good for 12 CEs. For more information and to save 10%, go to behavioralobservations.com and check out the show notes of this episode. Use the promo code podcast to save 10% on your registration. You're not going to want to miss it. We're also brought to you today by Behavior University, and their mission is to provide university quality continuing ed for the everyday practitioner. So if you go to behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations, you can save 10% by using the coupon code podcast. All right, on to today's episode. I am thrilled to bring back one of the most popular guests that we've had since the podcast began. That is Dr. Pat McGreevy. And we're going to be talking about, uh, surprise, surprise, teaching functional skills, but we're also going to be talking about teaching in a one-to-many context. You know, most of our instruction is one-to-one. Uh, and he's going to be talking about how to support kiddos when you have to teach more than one at a time. So uh, we talk about that for about half the podcast. And then we get into all sorts of fun stories and listener questions. So it kind of goes all over the map after that. And uh, we have just a lot of fun uh, chatting. So I think, uh, and I hope you enjoy it too. Um, so, um, for those who aren't familiar with Pat, uh, he is the author of the Essential for Living uh, Assessment and Curriculum. And uh, for the time being, there is free shipping until June 1st. Uh, so, if you again go to the show notes this episode, there'll be a coupon code there. So, um, I think that's it for opening comments. So, without any further ado, let's get to this fun conversation with Dr. Pat McGreevy. <laughs> Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Dr. Pat McGreevy, welcome back for round number two on the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How's it going? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Oh, I, uh, you know, you, I think we talked about this uh, a few months back when we were trying to get this on the schedule, but uh, you are right now the fifth or sixth most downloaded show of all the 78 episodes we have out currently. So your contribution to the podcast has certainly resonated with the audience, and I am just really excited to have you back here. So again, thanks for taking the time out of your day to join me. Sure. One of the reasons we are talking today is that uh, you touched base with me a little while back and the issue of teaching individuals not on a one-to-one basis but what we might consider a, a one-to-many basis or a, in a, you know some, some group instruction for um, uh, behavioral intervention uh, that the topic's been coming up and it's something that you wanted to speak about and that it was something that you had some some definite thoughts on so uh, I, I think that would be a topic that would serve our listeners pretty well. So I think what we'll do is have some back and forth about that. I've got some contributions from the listeners as it relates to that topic. And then if time permits, we've got all sorts of questions that'll allow you to wax poetic on the state of the field. So uh, <laughs> if we can get through the the one-to-many uh, stuff, then uh, we can we can ha- perhaps get some deep thoughts from Pat on all sorts of uh, issues in the field. But we'll see if I'm up to any deep thoughts this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think you'll do just fine. So, all right. So when I, I guess the, tr- the the treatment model, I think for most insurance based services is a you know generally a one to one model. Um, I know that's not universal, but that that seems to be the case from what I'm seeing, you know, you, you have uh, an RBT or perhaps in school settings, a paraprofessional working directly with students. Uh, and 
obviously there are so many advantages to teaching in a one-to-one context in terms of the individualization and so forth. So what, what made you start thinking about this kind of one-to-many or group instruction, uh, given the model that we have is, is uh, more of a one-to-one basis? Well, in my early days of uh, functioning as a behavior analyst, although in those days, no one called it that. We didn't call ourselves that and no one around called us that. But um, most of my early work were in two settings. Uh, One of those two settings, the two settings were hospitals and schools. And in the school environment, um, you, you seldom had the luxury of going in and being able to work with one person. I mean, oftentimes the referral was about one person, but you had to, the, the school wasn't staffed in a way as most schools aren't, that the teacher could spend very much one-to-one time with that individual. And so um, most of my early work was with more than one person at a time. And and then when, uh, as the field gradually grew and developed and expanded um, and into the insurance situation, uh, you know, especially in-home type of situations, uh, it was mostly one to one, and then even in centers, it became largely, although not exclusively, one to one. And what got me sort of back into it was, you know, seeing um, what's going to happen when these individuals, even if they make some strides with us in a one to one model, what's going to happen with them? Um, when they're away from that, not only is there is it not going to be one to one. All the supports and and uh, various procedures that are used may not be in place either. And then the other side of the coin is what about? Um, I mean, is this one to one model financially sustainable? I mean, is this something that we could count on being? a part of what we do in the future, uh, with the exception maybe of cases of severe injury or, or self-injury or aggression, in which case temporarily it might have to be one-to-one just out of uh, concern for the safety of the individual. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Some of the feedback from, from listeners when I threw out this topic – for a call for questions, most of the questions did come from school practitioners. So that issue is still relevant in, in that setting. Uh, so I, I think there is obviously a, a, a rationale for, for contemplating this. And also, as you, I think we're alluding to, is that the funding, at least in the United States, for adults with disabilities pales in comparison to the funding that's available uh, when they're uh, of school age. So, um, so. Let's talk about how, I guess the first question I have is, and this is a question echoed by many other folks who kind of contributed to the, uh, what, what I'm going to ask you today, uh, is, is just how do you conceptualize the lesson? How do you set it up? You know, um, especially if you have learners with different targets, different developmental levels, perhaps different repertoires of problematic behaviors and things like that. So can you give us kind of like the overview of what this might look like? And then we can kind of maybe get into the nitty gritty of the, you know, uh, data collection and things like that. Sure. Well, one of the additional things before we sort of talk about this is, is before we talk about how we would put people in groups and what we would do with them if they were, um, is, is another issue that, that I, uh, that's important. And that is, let's say you're teaching somebody to wait after they've made a request. That's a particular skill and essential for living. And many people would teach it even if it weren't. Um, and you might, you know, the child asks for something and you say, wait just a second. And you're looking right at them and you're sitting there and you think, when would that ever occur again? And it looks kind of unreasonable and nasty. I mean, why would I sit there and make somebody wait just for the arbitrary sake of waiting? 
And, um, and the answer is you wouldn't. I mean, you wouldn't just walk up to somebody and say, wait, when there wasn't a reason to wait, you see? Mm -hmm. And so um, putting somebody in a situation with another child where you're busy with the other child for the moment and it, the natural thing to do would say, wait just a second while I deal with this over here. Um, well, that's the circumstance under which it, waiting would happen most of the time is somebody else is busy, can't attend to you at the moment, and therefore you need to wait. And um, and so when you put them in a group, it's, it's, it, it, it approximates the situation in which it would naturally occur. So that's number one. Rather than just some arbitrary thing, if somebody walks up to you and says, and you say, can I have a cookie? And you say, wait, and you look right at him. I'm like, really? Who would do that? You know? So um, putting them into the situation with the group sometimes is a, especially with something like waiting, is a more naturally occurring situation uh, relative to what might occur outside of some kind of a therapy session. Now, what would you do? Well, first off, you could put people, one of the easiest things in a school environment is to take something that already occurs, okay? And that's a snack or a break time. That already occurs in a school environment. So you could start out with that, that particular period, that particular activity, and teach mans or requests because that's what would occur naturally in that activity, see? And um, most of the time in a school environment, that would not be a one-to-one -one kind of thing. People would be in a small group and certain people would be asking for their their cookies or their drink or somebody else would be asking for some chips or some bread or whatever it was you see and they'd be asking for whatever's part of their snack maybe some pieces of fruit or something like that you see so what you could do is you put those folks in a group and you're and maybe have one instructor and one teacher assistant or something managing a group of say four people okay so Part of what you do during the snack time, first off, you, you set it up ahead of time so the snack time will last longer than it would typically last. It might last 10, 15 minutes normally. And the way you're going to set it up now, it's, it's liable to last 40, 45 minutes because there's a lot of opportunities to teach in that context. So you might begin by having somebody, uh, oh, okay, and then th they would want something, and so you would show them how to ask for it. You see, then you would go to the next person. And then if the first person who just asked you wants to ask you again quickly, you would turn around and say, wait just a second. That's a naturally occurring thing. And then the, you would you would um, you would uh, then go to the next person and, and honor their request, you see, and then go back to the first person who's waiting, you know, and then meantime, if the if the first person who's struggling to wait has a little problem behavior, okay, then you would contrive another opportunity for the second person to make a request and then take the person's hand and hold it, hold it up, hold the thing that they're asking for. Okay, wait just a second. And maybe that person can only tolerate like a half a second. So you say, wait just a second. Nice waiting. When it's just instantaneously and, and it was done errorlessly, then you go back to the other person. OK, then you go to the other people. And as you get better at it, you can put three, four people in a group. Maybe in the beginning, you're only comfortable with two people because there's a lot of back and forth going on, you know, so you might do that. Then maybe with the two people, when you have two people together, you, it's a perfect opportunity to teach sharing or taking turns because you have two people. If you have one person that there's no real naturally occurring way to do that except to share it with the instructor and that isn't the way it would typically occur. So you might say they're both asking for a cookie and you break it in half to, well, let's share this. You can have this and you can have this, see? And so they both ask for it, but they also all have it a same right in built into that activity is sharing, see? Or, and then they, and then, then the next time somebody wants one and you say, oh, well, no, it's not your turn. It's Charlie's turn. Charlie goes first. You go second. So now you're taking turns. You're learning that you're not the first one in line. So now you've got about three or four skills that are all occurring back and forth. 
if you can imagine another situation, if you've watched Dr. Carbone sit and do stuff at a table and it's all mixed and buried and it's very fast paced, it's all over the place. This would be like that, except there wouldn't be any cards. There wouldn't be laminated cards being slid around a table. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. There would be, this would be other kinds of events, but, but mixed and varied and back and forth and errorlessly taught and prompted and contrived just like that. I see. So I think you touched on this topic briefly, but I want to come back to it. So you mentioned an example of a learner who might have a very low tolerance for waiting, which led me to think about what might be the prerequisite skills to doing this type of instruction. And I was wondering, prior to you mentioning that example, if there is a specific amount of time one should be able to wait before doing this in a group context. But it sounds like you can do it, at least in the way in which you've described it, sooner rather than later, and shape up that uh, that waiting repertoire. Yes. Now, I, I would try to do it in the group setting first. But let's say, let's say that there's immediate and intense disruptive behavior when you say the word wait. Or let's say there's aggression or self-injurious behavior when you immediately say wait, such that now you've got to be concerned about protective equipment or you've got to get, you know what I mean? It, it could be very difficult to manage with two people. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, then you might sit aside and go back to your one to one and say, hold the thing in front of the learner and say, wait, and then give it to him immediately. So all you're teaching them to do in the beginning is to listen and tolerate the word wait, but you're not teaching them to wait the act of waiting. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And then just sort of do that gradually till you can get them and then get them to wait up to one or two or three seconds and then bring the activity back into the group where it's safer to do in a group environment and go back to your one-to-one -one when it's not safe, when it's, um, it's too intense at the moment and too difficult to manage with another child. Got it, got it. Uh, and, and while we're on the topic of teaching waiting, we might as well, I, I'm anticipating questions I'll get uh, from, uh, from folks. Um, could you explore how you would titrate up the waiting time in that one-to-one -one context? So again, let's go back to the example of a learner who immediately has some level of significant problem behavior when, when told to wait. Uh, I get the idea of saying wait and immediately providing reinforcement. What would be the, the criteria for stepping up that interval of time for waiting? And, and you know, so if you can kind of walk us through how to, how to move that up and increase that individual's ability to wait, I think that would be of great benefit to the listeners. Sure. Well, People who listen to this might might if they've been to one of our workshops, they they might recognize this. Um, what I often do is I will show I will give that example and then I will say something like, OK, you could teach waiting for one second and two seconds and then three seconds and then four seconds and then five seconds and then eight seconds and then ten seconds. And then I'll ask the audience, I said, for those of you, especially who are behavior analysts, What's the potential problem with doing it that way? And what might happen? And I ask people, give me the, the, the name of the phenomenon. First off, you might get problem behavior. And what do you call that? What's the name for that? And a surprisingly small number of people can come up with the name, even board certified people. Mm -hmm. And what I'm looking for is ratio strain. I see. And then I say, okay, now that's all right. But now... Here's the difference. You can learn a term for an exam and preparation, but when you see this happen, then that term comes to life. Then you see now, oh, I see what this is. Look what happens when I don't account for that. You see? Yeah. And now the term comes, I call it when a, when a term in our field comes alive. So then I will say, okay, how would you do that? Well, you could do it with a variable schedule quite quite or a variable time schedule quite easily. So you do one second and one and one and one and two 
and just sneak the two in real quickly and then back to one and then two and one and one and two and three and one and two and four and move it up variably and then add one other piece that that most people won't think to do and that is every so often make it a free one so for instance when you say wait you say oh no that's okay you don't have to wait and give it to them right away so there's a zero so there's no, yeah. no wait yeah and every so often you don't have to do it very often every so often when you do that it's pretty powerful and then you gradually up it and you don't have to up it one second at a time. You can bounce it around. And how far you advance it is just a judgment call on your part to see how much you think you can get away with. It's like um, uh, the other day, uh, yeah, Blakeney and I were talking about fading prompts and prompt fading and how some programs, what they do is they'll teach a person to fade, you know, here and then here and then here. And there's a nice little step. And you don't fade until you get three or four correct responses in a row with a certain fade and there's sort of rules for that or some people set them up right the rules of three as it sometimes yeah. Uh, yeah yeah uh, and so eb and i were talking about it and i said you know no one ever taught us that and we've been doing this like 40 some odd years and did anybody ever did you ever learn it no i never learned a rule like that did what's the rule for fading a prompt and we both agreed it's something like this you fade it when you think you can get away with it. <laughs> and, and, and that's the, the rule is no more systematic than that. And it, it because there's so many things about your interaction with the child and the child's history and how they've been responding lately and what kind of a day they're having and da 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 da. You see? And the same thing would, would, would be the case with waiting. You think you can get away with it. And if you sometimes you bite off a little too much, you pay the price. You know, you inch it out too far and you get a little episode. Well, that just teaches you to go back and inch it a little more gradually and move it around. Yeah, the learner's uh, learner's always right. That's right. Uh, one of the things that occurred to me as you're describing the variable nature of doing the waiting, uh, especially in the context of giving a free one periodically, is it kind of reminds me of a lot of the work that Greg Hanley's doing, and he's been on the podcast uh, several times, and uh, some of the... Uh, functional communication training and denial tolerance training and things along those lines, they do call for random immediate delivery of reinforcement periodically. And obviously that helps glue everything together and it would fall apart if, if it weren't for that or be at risk of falling apart if, uh, if it wasn't for that. So, um, that was helpful to step through that. I think just we could probably end the podcast here, and I, I think that would be of great benefit to all the listeners. But and we shall not. We want to go forward with this. Um, um, so you, you you gave a nice description of how to do this during snack time and uh, other more kind of I suppose leisure times and whatnot. What would you? How would you arrange a, a, a lesson or a session or whatever you want to call it? when the objective is to teach, say, you know, your basic verbal operands, you know, or other types of skills with, with a group of learners, especially those with working on various targets, if you will. Well, I would, uh, assuming that maybe most of the responses, well, no, you wouldn't either. I was just going to say maybe, so most of what you would want from them would not be man's, but uh, they probably would be. Just, you know, to some extent. So put them in some kind of an activity that they can do together or it's the same type of an activity. Maybe they're playing or they're interacting with something, but it isn't the same thing. But it's something each of them is involved in. See, and if it is, then uh, or if it's the same activity, the beauty of that is then you have a chance to 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 uh, to teach sharing and taking turns because that's a naturally occurring kind of phenomenon. But it could be any activity um, like that, and you put two people together, and as you get more comfortable, you put three people together. I would recommend that most people start with two. Um, and um, it is, it'll, the, the first few times you do this, you're gonna be going back and forth and back and forth. And I mean, <clears throat> if you've watched, you know, Dr. Carbone do some stuff. If you, if you were to say to him when he's doing one of his 
mix and vary things that he and I used to do, and he still does, is you'd say, Vince, do you know what you're going to do three trials from now? His answer would be no. I don't know what I'm doing three trials from now. I'm literally kind of flying off the seat of my pants here. And and when I see an opportunity, I seize it. You see, when somebody looks like they're interested, then I'm jumping on that right there at that moment in time. So it isn't like um, you have to practice this and get some guidance with this to get good at this. This is not something that you sit down and do this right away. Most people wouldn't. Mm-hmm. Um, I uh, worked with a young man and, and, and still do occasionally in England. And I watched him do it with almost no instruction. And I showed him what I wanted him to do. And he just flew around three kids like very few people I'd ever seen before. And he had no formal behavioral training at all. None. Since then, he's acquired formal behavioral training. He didn't have any at all then. Mm -hmm. And I just watched him literally fly between two or three kids, jumping, running, flying. And he was just a natural at it. Very few people are like that. Um, You know, and now and imagine how far this is from very early days of discrete trial instruction in our field where somebody might sit down and say, Touch your nose. Good job. Mark data sheet. Go to the next trial. Say the same thing. Well, you know what the next trial is going to be. That's pretty easy to do. Once you get that pattern, that's not difficult to do at all. But what we're suggesting is a far cry from that and requires an awful lot of momentary decision making. Uh, You got to have your wits about you because you're going back and forth between at least two people. And um, it takes a little while there quickly, but not a lot of people do. And it takes a little practice to get good at this. And and uh, it's well worth doing, though. Are you in need of continuing education? Well, Behavior University is a BACB approved continuing ed provider, and their mission is to provide university quality courses and ABA for new and experienced professionals alike. Their live webinars generally have a limited number of attendees so that the learning experience is highly interactive. And if you can't make the live events, these webinars are recorded and available in Behavior University's CEU library for later viewing. Behavior University also has a 40-hour RBT training. This self-paced course uses a combination of visual presentation, audio lectures, and live video models to teach all areas of the RBT task list. The course is accessible anytime and from anywhere. So if you'd like to learn more, head on over to behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations, where you'll find a 10% discount for podcast listeners. Again, that's behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations. And thanks for checking them out. Are there some specific activities? You know, you mentioned some potential cooperative ones. Um that lend themselves to doing this type of work? You know, uh, you know, if I'm a, an analyst listening to this right now, I'd probably be nodding my head in agreement with a lot of what you're saying. But I'd, I might have questions about, okay, well, what would be a, a specific activity that I could, so I could use with my learners? So based on that, what, what might be something that you, or what has been, uh, an, what, what could be an example of something that you've seen work well as it relates to either, a, whether it be a game or an activity or something like that, that allows the instructor to uh, occasion varied responses, whether they're, you know, man's tax, et cetera. Well, if you have something that both people are interested in, as an example, like an activity, and you have two people, then it's easy to contrive circumstances where one gets to go before the other. So there's taking turns. There could be opportunities, depending on the task, to have them both engage in it at the same time or partly engage, and there's opportunities for sharing. See? Um, And then there's plenty of opportunities for waiting and plenty of opportunities for, no, you can't right now. You see? Mm -hmm. 
uh, many people would call that denied access. We, we, we might say accepting no, but it's just about the same thing. Um, and when we incorporated in our curriculum, Essential for Living, the Essential Eight, these are some of the Essential Eight skills because these are skills that tend to, uh, it, when they're absent, uh, tend to uh, result in problem behavior. Uh, uh, and uh, they're, they're some of the same skills that Dr. Hanley would teach to many of the learners that they're working with. And, um, uh, and then, um, uh, so when you, if you put somebody into a, a situation where there are two activities and both people like them, you see, then they're going to have to take turns because there's only one opportunity to engage one activity, one thing to do deal with. So there's lots of those circumstances where, um, or, or maybe something, another, another example would be an activity where, um, you, it could be accomplished if both people did part of it. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because later when people get a little bit older, they could, they will, they'll be put in vocational settings where that's the case where one person does the first piece of the activity and somebody else does the next piece. See, then they have to make sure that they wait and make sure it's their turn and don't do it until that person is completed, all that sort of thing. Got it. Got it. You mentioned things about, uh, people needing a high degree of skill. Obviously this is not for, uh, beginners, if you will. Uh, what, what would be, some suggestions you might have for someone who does not have experience doing this, but is obviously convinced that this would be a good thing to work on based on the rationales we've discussed already. Uh, how, how can someone become better at this uh, who, who may not have experience doing this, particularly in the given that a lot of the folks working in the field right now are working in one-to-one -one settings well, I think I'm I'm sort of old school about this. Uh, I, I think probably safer to say I'm not sort of old school. I'm seriously old school. <laughs> I think uh, I, yeah, I think that's I, true. The way I learned it is, you know, and the way I would want it to teach it is somebody sitting there right with me with a child. I see. That's what I'd want to do. The trouble is that our field is growing so rapidly that there just aren't enough people or people with the appropriate experience to provide the, the, the supervision and the guidance that many people need. So in the absence of that, I would videotape somebody doing it, watch that several times. Then I would put a video camera over my shoulder, videotape myself in four or five minute segments and see if I could learn from watching myself relative to the other videotape that I consider the model, you see? And I might, I might be able to pull it off myself. That's a great tip, especially given the considerations you mentioned. Um, what would I mean, be your you used to say when I was on the faculty at FIT, excuse me for interrupting. No, no, go ahead. The, um, um, one of the things that I recommended to the students that by the time they finish school, is that they should be extremely familiar with their laptop and know how to move around it. And, and I would make even joking comments about it'd be much easier if it were a Mac because of its visual capabilities. And then get yourself a video camera. And most of the time when you buy a video camera, they'll, they'll give you a tripod or give you one for so cheap that it barely costs anything. And consider that part of your operating equipment. And what you do occasionally, even when you're by yourself, is to put it over your shoulder and videotape yourself for five minutes and take a look at that later on in the absence of having more frequent supervision. That's a great tip. You know, Jim Johnson used to tell us in graduate school, you know, if you're not taking data on yourself, you're not a behavior analyst, which I always, uh, which I always thought was... Uh, oh, well, that was Ogden. Ogden did that all the time with us, too. Oh, he, yeah. I'm sure that's where he... he most of us, we wore counters. We either wore a bead counter or a clicker counter. And he said, what do you, what do you, what do you manage of your own behavior? 
You know, you talk about managing other people's behavior. What about your own? I say that's good accountability. Yeah. Um, speaking of taking data, got a ton of questions about taking data in the group context. Uh, what are your recommendations for how practitioners might go about doing that? Well, this came up um, more directly and obviously when Vince Carbone and I were doing a lot of work together in the late 1990s and toward it, toward in about the year 2000. And he was wanting to do the mixed and varied and the fast paced stuff, which came from direct instruction and, and mixed and varied from bits of research and so forth. And one of the things we were committed to was to teaching skills to fluency rather than the mainstream, which is 2% to some percent level. We were not into that at all and didn't particularly think that was valuable. And we looked around at what we were doing and teaching and and it was really difficult. The mechanics of of trial by trial data were just extraordinarily difficult to try and collect the data. Then we even experimented a little with five minute videotapes and recording the data from the tape. But then when we were mixing and varying tasks, then we had the trouble. What do you call that response class? What do you call that? And so we would invent names like mixed verbal behavior one, mixed verbal behavior two. But that didn't really tell you what was in there unless you looked more closely at it. What what was that? What what was that response class? So we came up with the what he and I used to call cold probes, which were essentially probe data, first opportunity of the day or of some part of the day, probe data. And the rationale for that, which many people may not know, is that if, you know, latency is every bit as much a part of fluency as frequency or rate is. And yet much more commonly in the precision teaching world, people had measured fluency by using frequency or rate, depending on what you call it, a number per minute or number per time period. But if you only had one opportunity, we remembered what Ogden used to call latency. In the early days, he called it frequency of the first, meaning huh. frequency of the first response. That's an old, uh, that's an old Ogden expression. And so what we did is we said, well, latency is too hard to measure because your reaction time is 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 you know difficult to factor out of that the amount of time it takes for you to depress the clicker or to write the number from the time you began to do it or the occasion was there to do it if that makes sense yeah so what we did is we set up a fluency criterion so you had to respond within one se two seconds sometimes even within one second so if i said to you what's that and you pointed to something you're, you're going to start to say cup pretty darn quickly. And if you don't, we're going to continue to teach that until you do. And we're going to prompt out any latency that might already be in there. So if I say, what's that? And you go, uh, uh, cup. And let's say you're a coic, so I can prompt you vocally. So then I would give another, it's okay. Then I would, then, then on that probe trial, the answer is we don't know yet what your what your what your performance is like because you haven't really if there's latency involved in it. So what I would do is I'd repeat the trial. OK, and then I'd say, what's that? Say cup, cup. Beautiful. That's it. OK, so that person needed an echoic prompt and the latency was prompted out of that. Now all I have to do is fade the echoic prompt and I have a fluent response. That's a great example. Does so, that make sense? And so, so when you're doing these mixed and varied things, this is what Vince and I used to do. Then you take and do your trial, your probes of your individual items. Then you do your teaching, mix everything up. I do it, We would do it the same way. 
And that's why in Essential for Living, we we make extensive use of first opportunity of the day or part of the day probes, trials, and there's a latency criterion built in. Um, and one of the parts of our curriculum is there's no mention of the word percent anywhere in the curriculum, front to back. Not a single mention of the word. That's by design. So there's, and yet that's that's not mainstream at all, but there's no mention of that. We want people responding quickly. But we also know that this trial by trial data, when you're in the midst of teaching like this, it's extremely difficult to collect because it interrupts the whole teaching process as you're doing it. I see. So this is something I think we talked about this perhaps offline at one point or another, but uh, I am um, learning more and more about the, you know, the, uh, the standard acceleration chart. And we've had, you know, numerous shows uh, you know, where people have talked about it. So what exactly would you be uh, uh, putting on the chart if you're collecting data in this way? And this well, might just be me exposing my ignorance, uh, perhaps, of, of, of how to, but for, I have to assume there's going to be a number of listeners who might be in the same boat. Oh, no, not, not a matter of ignorance at all. This is a real challenge. And one of the things that um, we had was, what do we do with this? If you put, if you decided to record the latency, you see, then the difference between one and two seconds on the chart wouldn't be very much. And the difference between two and three seconds is substantially different in the sense of its impact on the learner, but it wouldn't show up, there wouldn't be much difference on the chart. So when we were teaching like this, we went off the chart. We, we, would, we would go back to the chart when we are recording frequency and duration. Those two things, when duration was a, was a relevant measure of something, and frequency was uh, an e a measure that you could collect without interrupting the teaching. Then we were back to the chart. You see? Okay. Now, what, 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 what we're exploring right now but haven't really done much yet with is if you have uh, – in our, in our system, we have performance criteria when you're learning something. So let's say it's a man. And the first box you get is no self-injurious or aggressive behavior. And the next one is no disruptive behavior complaining. Third one is no resistance to prompts. And then the next box is full prompt, partial prompt, minimal prompt, independent. The next box is two settings, two people toward generalization. And what we're thinking of doing is if you use the, the um, one or two second line on the chart as your, let's say you use the one second line on the chart, you could make that the floor, and if those, if there are eleven criteria, you could make a cumulative graph of those eleven steps. Now, those are not individual daily responses; those are collections of responses. But we haven't done it yet. We're playing around with it, um, and we haven't really systematically done very much of it lately. I've been toying with it and playing around with it, but. Um, uh, it's a challenge because latency, while you can measure it on the chart, you can display it on the chart, measuring it is 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 quite the challenge. You see? Yeah. And and um so that's why we put it in as a criterion. In other words, you had to you had to do it within one or two seconds, and we did it very simply without any devices or anything. Somebody we you know, we would say, What do you call that? And in your head, you know, as a private event, <clears throat> you would do 1,001, 1,002. And by the time you get to the number two, if they haven't started to respond, it's not fluent. Now, you would you'd allow some people <clears throat> whose the physical nature of their disability would preclude them from responding that quickly. You would allow them a, a, <clears throat> a longer time, like some children with forms of cerebral palsy wouldn't be able to respond within two seconds, even on their best day. Their body would not allow them. So we would change their fluency criterion to another, you know, some additional seconds because their body wouldn't allow them to 
respond any quicker to that. Got it. Got it. That's helpful. Um, so I have, again, a lot of questions on a whole host of other topics, uh, but is there anything else you want to say about this group instruction before we transition? Well, then you would, you would do your group instruction. You would prompt, prompt fade. <clears throat> but then when you collect your data before your group instruction, you could just do individual probes on each of the activities, <clears throat> each of the skills that you're going to teach, then get in and teach, fade your prompts. Now, we use a self-graphing data sheet, and what some people do is they mark like they might circle it in red, and that is their their first opportunity probe. And then they might teach for a while. And then at the end of the teaching session, they go back to their data sheet and circle one of the other criteria, and that's kind of like where they left off that day. In other words, what prompt level or whatever was required that day. And it kind of reminds them the next day where they left off. I see. So one of the things I want to ask you before we kind of move on to some of these other questions is that, you know, you've, you've, you've mentioned essential for living. Um, what, is, I guess one question I had is what, what's new with essential for living these days? It's, I think it's been, I think a year or more since we last uh, had you on the show. Um, I know there's apps available and things along those lines, but um, so what, what's going on with you guys these days? Uh, well, uh, I think for us, it's uh, it's a process of learning to teach people how to use it uh, more productively and effectively than we have in the past. And I, I, I hope we're getting better at that. Um, I think that there's a uh, an increasing recognition among a lot of people that the kind of skills that Dr. Hanley and his group teach after a function after a, uh, a, a, a functional assessment that's basically a synthesis is very similar to the kinds of skills that we teach. Our essential eight and his categories of cooperation, communication, and toleration. I mean, there's a substantial overlap, even though they were developed independent of one another. Um, there's a considerable overlap and more people are recognizing, I think, how important those skills are, especially in people with very limited repertoires and or problem behavior. And uh, I think that's that's one of the most exciting things that's happening with, I think, both our work today. I see. So the yeah, it sounds uh, as we talked about it uh, earlier in our conversation, a lot of the stuff you're talking about. Sounds very, very similar. So it's good to see that, uh, I guess there's a convergent, uh, corroboration, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. all right. So, uh, we're going to delve into some kind of, uh, what we might call random questions for, uh, you know, from listeners. And I, I have to say, I have to give my, my, uh, audience a lot of credit because I got just tons of questions when I threw out the idea of you coming back. So, um, I'm going to start with, um, and, and some of the questions I've already asked because I've got a lot of similar ones that had so many over, so much overlap that we've we've kind of rolled them into earlier parts of our discussion. So, um, but as far as more distinct questions, um, Elizabeth writes in, and man, she uh, she is asking a lot of questions that are kind of near and dear to your heart. She's concerned about school districts adopting essential for living. Uh, what's preventing this from happening? Um, she also uh, has a question here, you know, do you think it, it is becoming a human right issue when students when, with significant delays and skills due to their disabilities are not being taught, but instead housed in special education centers with very little teaching going on? Um, she has almost 30 years experience working in various settings like this and obviously is quite concerned about some of the things that she's seeing. Um, and so she's perhaps paraphrasing here a little bit, concerned about the advocacy of, of getting functional living skills to individuals who, who need them, I suppose. Uh, um, so w I guess I, I, I could probably 
anticipate what your thoughts are on this, that there would be some level of agreement. What are you seeing, though? Because I know you're out and about doing trainings and things along those lines, and, and therefore might have your finger on the pulse a little bit in terms of what is out there for individuals who, who need these kind of more functional daily living skills. What's your sense of what's going on these days as it relates to supporting individuals with these types of needs? Uh, well, th- there's a two part answer to that question. And, and the parts have to do with the settings in public schools. The biggest, the, the single largest drawback to, um, Can you still hear me okay? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, sorry. I was looking Uh, at other questions. (laughs) That's all right. The single single largest drawback to people doing it, to people teaching using like essential for living or functional skills curriculum is the common core state standards. When, When people are willing to be more flexible about how you use the common core state standards with respect to people with moderate to severe disabilities, then more functional skills are taught and essential for living is used. We, we are in the New York, we have been in the New York City public schools for three years because they, they're willing to be flexible. They're willing to say, listen, I'm not going to sit here and put this kid in a high school chemistry lesson, you know, who, who has virtually no speaking skills at all. We're not going to do that. And when more people step forward with the courage and say, we're not going to do that. That's just unreal. And they look at essential for living and other curricula as common core extensions or connectors, and they're willing to do that. We just finished a training several months ago with the Santa Cruz, California public schools. They have a very forward looking director. She's willing to do that. And when people are willing to do that, it begins to happen. We have several of the BOCES districts in New York, we recently have had a major impact in the uh, Fairfax County Public Schools, which is the largest suburban area of Washington, D.C. Their district has gone in pretty much all in. Uh, Baltimore County Public Schools recently, uh, five school districts in Dallas, Texas area. But these are districts that are willing and their directors are willing to take that leap. And when they are, then it can start to happen in public schools. And it's not a violation of any law, and it's not a, uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's the same rationale that people would use to use other curricula that are not specifically speaking to Common Core. That's number one. Number two, in ABA, in behavior analysis private agencies, the single largest drawback to teaching functional skills is our adherence to developmental curriculum in the autism world is our, our, our unwillingness to break from developmental curricula that are designed to take you to kindergarten and first grade, but are not designed to take you to the rest of your life. Now I say this with all due respect because Mark Sundberg is a good friend and colleague of mine whom I have enormous respect for. Um, and, um, and when I went and built Essential for Living or began to build it with Troy Fry. Um, I talked to him about it and told him he was in agreement. In page seven in our introductory, in the introductory chapter of our book was written by Mark and me together about when you would use a developmental curriculum and when you'd use a functional skills curriculum. But there are many people who are maybe having trouble with parent this, these discussions or whatever, but there's people everywhere I go There's 9, 10, 12, 14, 16-year-old children being taught two-year-old skills. And that that is something that our field has to get over. I pushed real hard to get the certification board to put some new curricular items in the task list, and they didn't and wouldn't. And because I think that that's one of the single – most obvious ethical issues we have right now going on. And there's ethics workshops every corner you turn. But I think that what's important is 
to some individuals, we're teaching the wrong thing. Yeah. And we're not preparing them for what would make for a good, high quality life. We're not. And we have to get our own house in order. And then we have to encourage more and more public schools that, um, that, uh, we don't need to be teaching people stuff that has no impact on their life and, and which they may find too difficult to learn anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, agree wholeheartedly. I also see sometimes a reluctance in parents to kind of yes. move on to a more functional type of, yes. you know, uh, curriculum, uh, you know, when it, talking to people in IEP meetings and things like that, um, Sometimes you come across parents who are very committed to inclusion. They they want their child to be with typical peers. But unfortunately, the student is at a developmental level where it's, you know, they're not benefiting from those settings. And I think in our first podcast, and I would recommend listeners who haven't checked that out to go back and, and listen to that, you, you laid out some very nice criteria for, or prerequisites for inclusion that I thought were very helpful. And when those those skills aren't in place, obviously, the student does not necessarily benefit from by osmosis. Um, all right. All right. Um, let's see. Nick Barron's former podcast guest from Fit Learning. Uh, he, Nick, you wrote in a ton of questions. I had to pick one of them. Uh, <laughs> he, he must have written like, I don't know, 15 questions, but. We'll go with this one. Who are some unsung heroes or leaders or pioneers in our field and what did they do? Well, I, I, the, the fact that Nick would ask a question like that, and I know Nick quite well, I'm not surprised. That's a terrific question. Um, I think he knows this person or knew of this person, but I don't know that other people would. I think in the early days, Eric Houghton is is a name that not a lot of people know. Uh, and had enormous impact in the early days of our field. I think that, uh, um, uh, oh, come on now. B. Barrett is another one. What, what, who's that? B. Barrett is another one uh, had, that had enormous impact uh, in the early days of our field. Um, uh, and then some of the early... Um, People that worked with Ogden, uh, Diana Dean, uh, had enormous impact in the early days of our field. Uh, some of the folks that worked with uh, uh, Jack Michael, uh, some people like uh, Brian Jacobson, for instance, had had some did some of the very very first um, videotaped behavior change projects that people could learn from by watching. Um, uh, those are the names that come to mind and there is, geez, there's a whole slug more than that. But um, uh, I think in terms of language, a lot of people don't know Joe Spradlin in terms of language development. And you could, Mark Sundberg could detail a lot of that if you were to talk to him about it, because he knew Joe very well. Um, but uh, those are some names that come to mind. Excellent. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, John Ashelman wrote a question. In, um, <laughs> yeah, these are, this is like the, <laughs> Pat McGreevy, this is your life. Um, uh and you might want to tell folks who, who, who he is if you, if you have a chance. But he said, how about covering what you said at IPTC two years ago about how in the 60s there was a debate about whether to call the upcoming Applied Journal the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis versus the Journal of Applied Behavior Synthesis and how a vote was taken and Java won out. Uh, how the field uh, differ if our outlook – how would the field differ if our outlook was – up at Bloom's taxon taxonomical synthesis level rather than further down at the analysis level. So I, I am paraphrasing this question John a little Eshelman. bit. Is that a John Eshelman question or what? <laughs> That's fantastic. So you, no, so you might want to provide, there's probably a, a ton of context to provide to that. So um, 
John is a professor at the East Chicago School, is pro- professional psychology, longtime behavior analyst, former student of Julie Vargas, and a longtime friend, and longtime standard charter. And um, I, I, about, I'm going to say, close to two years ago, well, maybe not quite that long ago, um, in terms of his work, I... Uh, I told Greg Hanley that story because I wondered if he'd ever heard it and he hadn't. And I heard it from Ogden. I wasn't there myself, but I think Ogden is a pretty good uh, source. And that when they were, when they came to the decision about what to call the new journal, the vote was four to two four for Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, and two for Journal of Applied Behavior Synthesis. And the synthesis argument came from Ogden and another person whom he wouldn't tell me who it was, but I have a pretty good idea who it was. Um, and um, the... Uh, are you, are you able to speculate uh, in this public forum, or I would? I, I I'd don't, rather not. Okay, yeah, understand. I'd rather completely. not. But um, because I don't know for a fact, I understand. It would, it would just be a guess on my part who the other person was. But the argument from Ogden and this other person was that you know they had come out of a human operant conditioning laboratory, the very first one ever at Med State Hospital, and in Boston, and. The idea was that if you got in from, you went from a lab to the applied world, you might say you're isolating variables, but are you really? Is there really analysis in the applied world? Or is most of what we do synthesis? That was the argument. And uh, I thought that uh, Dr. Hanley might appreciate that story in view of his work today. And that that story happened in 1968. That that event happened in 1968. And, of course, analysis won. Uh, the journal leaned more methodological than radical. Um, and, uh, and, you know, our field went on. And, and then there were the people who were more radical and the people who were more methodological and still are. Um, I think if if synthesis had won out, I think you would you would see more treatment packages. There are some now in the literature, but they're not all that common. And um, and I think we would have talked about isolating things in groups rather than in apparently individual events. And I think the argument that that why would you that might be more cogent is why would you separate something in an experiment or try to separate it in an experiment when it wouldn't occur that way outside the experiment? In other words, why would you try to separate escape as I and I won't speak for Greg Hanley, but I think he would say something along these lines. But that's for him to respond for too. Why would you try to separate that when in 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 everyday living you generally escape to something? It isn't a separate kind of thing. And so I think that that would have been a more cogent argument in our field early on instead of it now becoming a cogent argument at this point in our in our in our uh, evolution so to speak so we would arrive at that point sooner <laughs> rather than later yeah i think um i think greg would, yeah i think greg would probably concur with your uh uh, or I think I think you know I I'm just I'm just kind of going back to some of the conversations I've had with him. I, th- I think he said that directly, almost like one you know you, no one escapes to nothing or something like that. Um, and uh, he's like you know I think he gave an example once at a at a talk I saw like you know when you when you when you're homesick from work 
you're probably watching Netflix. You're doing something else, you know? And uh, yeah, so that was, uh, I think that's something that would be very congruent with his, his point of view. When you say treatment packages, are you thinking like, would an example of that be like functional communication training and combined with extinction or, you know, what, what, what uh, you know, when you say that we might have more treatment packages as a result of looking at things from a synthesis as opposed to an analytic level, is, would that be an example of what you're hinting at there? Well, e- e- yeah, let's say, let's take functional communication training as an example. The way it's done most of the time, not the way Dr. Hanley and his group would typically do it, but the way it has been done more traditionally from functional analysis, functional assessment, is that you would you would do your assessment and you would uh, attempt to estimate uh, whether the problem behavior was a function of either attention, escape from demands, access to tangible stuff, or of course the default hypothesis. Now, but but. What if you said, does that really matter? Are we sorting out something conceptually that wouldn't necessarily be sorted in everyday living? So instead of teaching a kid whose behavior is said to be a function of attention, an arm tap when it doesn't, it doesn't lead you to a repertoire. Arm tap is not the first part of your communicative repertoire. In FCT, it's the only part in more traditional FCT. Not, not, not the way in which Dr. Hanley does it, but prior to that. Mm-hmm. That's your, if, you, if, the, if, if your problem behavior is said to be a function of escape, your, your single replacement behavior is a break card or a sign for finished. And does that lead you to a communicative repertoire? It doesn't. It doesn't take you there. It's just a single replacement behavior. And um, I think that when you look at it as, as a matter of synthesis, then you say, okay, if you don't, if you can't function as a speaker, Number one, do you start what I mean? What's the most that what what's the thing that people would most often want to do with speaker behavior is they want to ask for something they want or something they don't want to go away. But why make it just one general generalized response? Let's do this and this. Oh, how about a cookie? Oh, and then could you turn the music down? Sure. But instead of it being one thing. It could be many things you would do with that many things that would occur together in nature, but wouldn't necessarily occur separately. I see. Yeah. And and again, to to quote Greg again, you know, I think he said something along the lines that uh, our our science has historically broken things down into what he described as perhaps unnatural categories for the purposes of I guess scientific communication, so there can be replications and extensions and things like that. So, yes, yes, I agree. All right, so this is former podcast guest uh, again, uh, Dave Stevens. He threw out, like Nick, he threw out, I think, almost a dozen questions here. <laughs> so, Dave, I'm sorry, I I, I could only pick one or two of them. Um, have you ever used Coke as a reinforcer? And he warned me that this is a long story, but he said it was a very good one. So, Oh, he knows that. Yes, of course I have. Yes. Is he, is he trying to get me to tell that? The, the... I think so. I think so. Oh, brother. Okay. Well, it'll take a couple of minutes. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Well, almost surely what he's referring to is that a number of years ago, I was working with a young man in in Montreal, and um, he had been um, moved from a big hospital setting, extreme behavior, aggressive behavior, and he hadn't done well in his placement, so they had moved him to a little artificial regional center, and that's where I met him. And when I got there, that they wanted me to work with him, and he is very, very aggressive guy, 
and he was 41 years old and he couldn't and he couldn't function as a speaker at all. And they gave me all these test results and all this stuff. And they were amazed that I didn't want to deal with any of that stuff. And that I asked him, I asked about his physical condition and what medications he was taking. And of course, to no one's surprise, it was three antipsychotics or whatever it was. So that's no surprise, but he was essentially a healthy man. And, uh, so, um, he, and I said, well, what's his favorite thing? And they said, Coke. And it was the days in which Coke had, was reformulating. If you remember those days. Oh, the new Coke or something like that. Called new Coke came out. Remember yeah. the it would say new Coke on the bottle. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So for our younger Coke. listeners, we, you might want to Google that. Uh. <laughs> yeah. And anyway, he was a fan of the classic Coke and didn't like the new Coke, which oh, is good. Good guy. I like this guy already. Yeah, me too. So anyway, he, um, uh, uh, to shorten the story, what I did was I went in the room with him and I took a Coke with me and I poured a little bit in a cup and I just gave him a whole bunch of free Coke in small increments. I just paired my behavior with a known reinforcer. And I just did a little of what people today call stimulus, stimulus parry. Nobody was calling it that in those days, but they are now. And, um, and so we finished a bottle of Coke and I hadn't done anything except pair my behavior with the Coke. And, uh, we started on a second bottle and I gradually got him to accept my touching his hand and physically guiding him. And I eventually got him to make the sign for Coke. And in Quebec, they have their own sign language, which is kind of an unusual phenomenon, but Quebec's a very independent place. Indeed. I was just there a few weeks ago, so. Yeah, it just occurs in Quebec. Long designed to Quebec, LSQ. And I happen to know the sign for Coke in LSQ. And so I taught it to him. And if you take your finger and you kind of curl it, curl it down your neck right over your Adam's apple, and that's with your index finger, and that's the sign for Coke. And I taught him that pretty quickly. And by the end of the second bottle, he was doing it all by himself with no independent, you know, part at all. And later in the day, I'm to go over to see another young lady in the other part of the regional center. And she's just, oh, she has rumination and pica and other forms of self-injury. She's a mess. So I spend several hours with her, come back, and I'm on my way to go to another regional center that afternoon. And I'm coming down the hallway, and Guy comes running down the hallway, barreling down there toward me. So he sees me. And when I get to the door to leave, he gestures toward me to, I had my camera bag in one hand and my computer bag in the other. He gestures toward me to put both bags down, like, mm, 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 like that. See? And so I put them down and he insisted on picking them up and taking them to the car. Now you could take that two ways. That's either an extraordinarily polite thing to do and very nice and very friendly, or you could take it the other way. He might want, he might be anxious for me to leave. Here's your hat. What's your hurry? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't think that the, the second was there, but you, you, you don't know for sure. And then I get to the car and he won't let me touch the bags. He won't let me put them in the car. He insists on doing the whole thing all by himself. And then when all the bags are in the car and he opens the car door for me, he threw his arms around me and hugged me. And then you knew that's what it was. Wow. What a great story. Yeah. And, uh, he, uh, and of course his problem behavior just plummeted. Just one, just essentially he still had problems in, in the future because he didn't accept no very well. And so that was, but that was another circumstance, you know, other people might call that denied access. That's pretty much the same. And, um, he had, he had to be taught in that context, too. Mm-hmm. You know? Got it. I think we have time for probably one more question here. And this would be kind of a, a, a very open one. You can take this in any direction you want to, because it could probably go in any direction. <laughs> so, um, Pat, what are, this is from Emily. Uh, and Emily, thanks for writing this in. It's a great question. Um, Pat, what are the challenges that the field of ABA faces 
And what are your recommendations for helping the field thrive in the future? And I love this question, Emily. Thank you, uh, especially given that you have this kind of historical point of view um, being around in, in, at the early days of the field and also just continuing to be so active in the field today. You've got a perspective that is, that is uh, unusual. So love to hear your thoughts on that. Boy, that can go several different ways. <laughs> it doesn't uh, have to be your final well, thought about, on it, of course, course either. So, you know, just points. I think a few things that, um, um, well, obviously I feel very strongly that we have to be, sh we have to be as concerned about what we teach as how we teach it. And, uh, I think that's extraordinarily important. And so we have to have curricular presence in the task list that drives the programs that teach behavior analysts. That has to be a part of what we do. Uh, we're going to we're going to really pay a, an, a nasty price for that if that doesn't happen. Uh, we can have the greatest technology in the world, but teach wrong, to teach stuff that doesn't matter in people's lives. And, and not teach things that would matter. So that's number one. I think that uh, I would like to see the world of standard measurement still be given a rightful place and, and, and be respected in our um, discipline and that tradition continue. Uh, and and uh, because there are still journals that are less than willing to take uh, articles that where the data are displayed on a standard acceleration chart. And I wish that our field would be more open about that. I think we have to not abandon people who would need an aversive intervention in order to have any kind of a life at all. And I wish we would not do that. I wish we would open ourselves to and and continue to, to remain open to restrictive interventions in controlled circumstances so that some people who would require that. And there are those people, thousands of them who would require that. Um, have 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 a gateway to some kind of a better life. And. Uh, I mean, it's one thing to say, well, let's be positive in all circumstances. Okay, that's cute and nice. But if you haven't seen somebody with Cornelia DeLange blind themselves from their own self-injury because somebody was unwilling to put a little restraint on their arm or a protective face guard over them, then you, you, you wonder seriously um, whether the right to effective treatment is really alive and well in our field. And I think it should be. And, um, and then I think the last thing, there's probably five or six more, but I'm not going to bore the audience with those, those additionally. But the other thing that concerns me more than anything is we are training people at such a rapid rate. We are putting them out into difficult situations, which they are, have not been prepared to deal with. And that, that is certainly not their fault at all, nor the fault of any of these wonderful young people that are enjoying their first few years or so being behavior analysts. But um, we can't continue to train people at this kind of a rate. We just don't have the people to supervise them. We don't have the people to prepare them. I mean, they can sit down someday with some laminated cards in front of some kids and, okay, they can manage to at least do a reasonable job. But the day a child with Angelman sits in front of them, they won't have any idea in the world what to do or where to start. And, and uh, uh, if, if autism is continually funded with, with insurance and nothing else is, then what's going to happen is more and more people are going to be called autistic who probably wouldn't have been called that 15 or 20 years ago. And we're going to get more and more and more challenging people. And the people who sit in front of them will be people whom we as a field have not prepared to deal with them.
And I, and I think that's the issue. So I'll, I'll end my elongated list there. <laughs> great. Great. There's so many great takeaways from this conversation, Pat. Uh, thanks so much for joining me again. This is going to be a, a very thought provoking. Thank ep- you for doing this. Uh, you know, I hope that you realize what a nice impact your work has had and and continue to do it uh it's um it's a great contribution to our field we appreciate it very much thank you pat it's uh, fortunately there are uh this is a very reinforcing endeavor so it's a uh, it's uh it's it just be. just been unbelievably fun to 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 do so i i do not have any thoughts of stopping this any, uh, anytime soon so all right pat mcgreevy it's always always a pleasure sir same here thank you matt thank you for listening to the behavioral observations podcast with matt sicoria you can find matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com we also invite you to stay connected with us on facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on twitter at behavior podcast <laughs>